Hello and welcome to Meet Me at the Movies Open Dialogue. Noel T. Manning II here with Marco Belchami. So glad to have him joining us right here as we talk movies. And uh, just before we went on the air, I was reminding uh, Marco that we've spoken twice before, but we've never seen each other's faces. Uh, at least I've seen his face. I don't know if he's ever seen mine. So uh, glad to see you, Marco. Uh, thanks for joining us, buddy. Oh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, and uh, it's good to associate a face with the name now. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, uh, we look back over your career, it's hard to believe it, but two and a half decades, uh, you've been doing this. Uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing when you look uh, back at your body of work and you've worked on everything from feature films to uh, amazing documentaries to um, episodic television as well. Uh, I, I'm just uh, continue to always be on the lookout for what Marco is working on. So I'm, I'm glad to have you here today to talk a little bit about uh, A Quiet Place and uh, the sequel uh, as well, because it was really, wow, just a, a couple few years ago that this film came out of nowhere and really surprised everyone. Uh, I mean, we knew the names attached to it, but nobody expected it, uh, at least most audiences and even critics didn't expect it to be the hit uh, that it became. And in, in many ways, it was a self-contained film but it did leave the door open. And uh, with the success of what happened, here we are again, uh, seeing a film that uh, the first go around, it relied so much on score and sound design. And uh, I'd, I'd really love to hear you talk about that initial uh, project, getting into uh, the first film and then how things are a little different this time around. Yeah, well, um, like you said, it, it's, uh, it, it is sort of a special movie in that it relies heavily on the uh, music and sound, um, and there's so much silence. So whenever you do have music or sound, it's uh, especially prominent. Um, the, uh, I got approached for the, the first movie, um, and, you know, the concept was, well, we're doing this like silent movie, you know, and and I so I was immediately curious about that, uh, and I I met with John, and he explained the the premise of this being because he's not I'm not really a, I've done a lot of horror movies, but I don't I don't really identify myself uh, with horror movies because I I don't really like them that much. But the um, the the premise with this was that um, it's sort of according to John, it was always a, a family movie first. It was a family drama. And I think he's even called it like a love letter to his kids, you know, and um, I, I've heard him say that. And um, and the reason it became, I think, such a powerful horror movie or, or whatever you want to call it uh, is because you, it's so strong with the characters and you feel so much for the characters and you're so invested in them and their journey. Um, and so that was, that was great. And right from the top when the, from the first cut that I saw of that, um, I thought that was great. I, I, you know, there was a lot of things that I was uncertain about and there were, um, and in, in a way it was like, a, um, it was like a, it felt like it was a little bit like a school project because, um, because it, it, it was so open to, um, it was just so different to have this film that had no sound and, and even the, the monsters that were there were sort of not finished yet. So wasn't sure exactly what was gonna happen with them and all. Um, and what it did was it gave it an open canvas uh, yeah. to, to work from, which was really great. And, um, you know, John did have originally some inspiration for this uh, to, to share with me. Uh, he had this, uh, um, Brian Eno cover of um, of uh, David Bowie's Heroes song, uh, which he sent to me was that's what he was listening to and inspired him. And so that is where I drew my initial inspiration thematically for this movie uh, and for the theme, for the family theme, which plays in this, um, which plays in the first movie and then um, and continued into the second movie. But um, so, anyway, on moving into the to the to the second movie, it's not that different of a world from the first that that is set up. 
uh, thematically, it's all tied together. It, it's a very similar environment. And so those things that I established early on for the movie um, seem to carry through, you know, with some development and some new characters. Well, you know, this is not the uh, first time that you've been able to revisit characters or, or even storylines. I mean, I think back and, and looking at Logan uh, and John McClane from the Die Hard films that you've been a part of. Do you, did you find that you had any particular connection uh, in A Quiet Place Part Two to a particular character? Um, uh, was there a particular bond that you felt as you were uh, working the second go around since you now knew the characters, you knew the environment, you knew the story? Yeah, I, you know, the, the thing that's very powerful is the, and the thing that drives this movie through to the end, I think is this, this bond, this uh, father-daughter bond, which is, um, which takes place and actually have, uh, you know, has its own, warrants its own theme. Wow. Um, and that is something which starts in the, in the first movie and continues through. Um, and, you know, I don't have any daughters, but it, um, it, it, I think it's a, 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 a powerful sentiment and definitely influenced the, um, the music. What do you think audiences are going to feel and experience different uh, this time around uh, as it relates to engaging in the story and engaging in the characters with, with the help of what you provided with uh, the composing? And they also will talk about uh, you know, anything you want to share with the, the sound design as well, because they are so, um, so much a part of each other now. And you and I, last time we talked, you said that you really discovered that doing the Hurt Locker. And I think that's kind of continued over the course of the years is seeing that uh, bridge between the two, it just kind of overlaps. Yeah, um, you're right, that's right. In the Hurt Locker, I think that's when I really became uh, conscious of the um, interweaving of music and sound and them working together. And it's, you know, probably up until that point, I always viewed the sound department a little bit as an adversary. Uh, it's something that is you're, you're uh, fighting for space on the dub stage. Sure. Um, but but um, since that point, when um, almost where that line between sound and music is blurred a little bit, and you're not sure if, and it doesn't matter, um, right. because it's all part of the emotional score of the film. Um, and that became more prominent in, as, as I was working in, and these films especially became really important because they, they do work hand in hand. Um, and, 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 and in uh, A Quiet Place too, there's two, basically two components to the score. There's the acoustical elements. There's some of these thematic things that are for the, the characters. Then there's also um, the things that rely uh, or relate more to the to the narrative and to the um, the monsters and the suspense and and all that. And and a lot of that is uh, in this hybrid world of of um, sounds, acoustical sounds that have been manipulated or non, or even non-acoustical sounds that have been manipulated for, um, for reuse and uh, have created this other world for, for, the, for, the, for the movie. I think a lot of the suspense in this movie, in, in a way, this one's different from the first because this is almost a, it's almost an adventure movie. I mean, they go off, they leave the, the farm and it uh, opens up to be, you know, a little bit of a bigger scope in that sense. Uh, right. And so there's, there's a little bit more room to develop the themes that were established in the first movie, but in a, in a broader sense. And um, I mean, it all yeah. I think, ties together. Well, when I think about February, 2020, um, I was supposed to be headed to an early screening of this movie. And that was the last early screening I was going to be attending before, uh, before chaos ensued and the pandemic 
uh, hit in. And I think it's really interesting when we look at the, the landscape of what's happening within the film A Quiet Place. It's very much pandemic related because you, you get that feel, you know, you're, there are certain things you're having to do. You're, you're not wearing masks, but you're having to be quiet. You know, there, there's so many similarities to kind of what we've experienced different ways, of course, but it's just, I, I found it kind of interesting that that was the last film I was going to be screening before everything happened. And here we are finally being able to talk about it. I mean, I think it's a great movie to sort of open up theater, theaters again to, uh, you know, I know Paramount sort of relying on this for, to get people back into theaters. And I think there's no, there's a perfect film for that. Um, and yeah, uh, and I'm anxious actually to see it because I never even saw the, the final mixed movie. Uh, I, you know, because they, they were, they were, I think it was February, 2020, um, when they had like a playback of the dub, probably right around the time you were going to screen it or see it. And, you know, I was just hearing about the virus and, and I didn't want to fly to New York to, to you know, to be, yeah. to, so, so I never even saw the final version. I, you know, for all I know, the music's all, all, uh, backwards and, and, you know, I don't, <laughs> but, uh, so I'm, so I'm really curious to, I'll be one of the first ones to see myself. Yeah. So, so, you know, thinking back over the course of the, the pandemic, what, what did you learn either positive or negative about filmmaking and, and were there things that you were able to, to explore that maybe you probably wouldn't have uh, had it not been for lockdowns and for the changes that we all experienced? Well, uh, look, I mean, what, what we do as composers is pretty solitary uh, in general. We work in the rooms <laughs> and a lot of time by ourselves. So I, in that sense, not, that much is different, I, you know, I, not that much has changed. I, I think the the biggest thing for me is that um, my favorite part is, is one of my favorite parts is to actually be with the musicians making music, you know, you write the stuff and then when you actually get to be present with them. And that was, I think one of the hardest things for me is we had projects that we were scoring during the pandemic and everything was remote, everything was, um, over Zoom and uh, you know um, sound movers and different programs and in different countries and it just became really tedious. It became I didn't I didn't even look forward to the scoring sessions at that wow. point. You know it was um, because you're 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 not able to shape the music in the same way you're sort of giving direction over Zoom and it um, I, I found it a little demoralizing so that, that that was the um i think the biggest change yeah, the neg definitely the negative aspect of it I, and i think you're you're right there's something about you lose that organic natural feel yeah. uh when you're doing things uh, like this I, I do think it's um you know there there are benefits and, and negative to what we've all experienced i think during this time but that's a um i think that's a, a key point for you yeah. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about when you first met uh, and talked to John about about this movie, and he pitched uh, the uh, the cover of David Bowie's uh, Heroes for you to kind of get that sense. Uh, and, and previously, we talked about how some uh, filmmakers will pitch you ideas or concepts. Do you have a preference when you're going into a project? Do you, would you like to have kind of an idea of what the director would want, or do you like that free reign? Uh, that you were mentioning a little earlier as well. Um, it's always good to know what the director is thinking because, you know, for me, it's a, this is a collaborative business. It's not like just writing free music to, for a concert. Um, and um, to hear the insights of what the director is thinking, uh, make it, if they're able to express it, make it that much more of an enjoyable process. The, um, uh, that's not to say that I'm in love with having temp music uh, on the track when I start working because, uh, you know, sometimes that can stifle things a little bit. You know, it doesn't always have to. Uh, sometimes it can be a good indication of what someone's thinking, but, and, and sometimes you can get new insights into how this might work. But for the most part, it's, um, I, I think it's a necessary evil of, of the this and sort of detracts a little bit from the creative process uh, but i i do enjoy the collaborative nature of film scoring so yeah. in the same vein would you prefer to have a script 
presented to you or no. compared to a project? No. So you no. like the project no. underway? I've, I've worked from scripts. To me, it's very uh, dis, um, disillusioning. Um, I, I, I feel like there's so many different ways to interpret a script. And music is so much dependent on um, it's it's very specific uh, to the way things are acted and the way it's shot and the color, the pacing and so many things that you, that when you read a script, it, it, I feel like it's so easy to go off on tangents and be going down the wrong path. I've done it a couple of times and every time I've tried to work from a script, I've been wrong and I've had to rewrite everything. Wow. So um, I, I'm, I'm much more visually inspired, you know, even if it's, even if I'm just working from, dailies or if I'm working from something rough, you know, because I do, I do think it's important to get on board early and start sharing it. Just, I just, um, I'm not crazy about working from a script. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you've talked about um, some of the things that you feel that you've grown and how you've changed over the years and you've had experiences. Are there things that maybe if you look at like the past five years that you feel have taught you even more about yourself than, than you've, thought about previously as it relates to composing and filmmaking in general? Well, I mean, this this whole process of being a film composer, one of the great things about it is that you're working with new directors constantly and everybody has um, unique things about them that you can learn from, which is really what I love about this. So I, yeah, I mean, I could talk in depth about each particular project and, and what I learned from it, you know, I can tell you what, you know, great things I learned from uh, director Bong Joon-ho, or I can talk about Tommy Lee Jones, or I can talk about um, James Mangold, or, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and um, you know, e each one is, I think, really interesting, at least to me, the things that they teach me. Some are very musically oriented and have and and uh are pretty savvy like jim he was is really knows a lot and and even down to the tone of the instruments and, and all he it, it he has thoughts about it. and that really shaped how i think about like how i record you know um and how, how we do things um we could go down a rabbit hole with this pretty quick <laughs> that's that's a that's a good place and i know we've got to, to wrap up but but one final question, uh, if there's uh, one composer right now that everybody should have on a playlist other than Marco Beltrami, who would you say has to be on everybody's playlist? I would say Brandon Roberts for Marcus Trump. Okay, awesome, yeah. awesome. Marco Beltrami, thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk with us right here on Meet Me the Movies Open Dialogue uh, about your work uh, in, uh, in cinema and documentary and, uh, and also uh, focusing uh, today on the sequel to A Quiet Place. And uh, thanks, any final thoughts or final comments you wanna share with our audience? I hope you all enjoy it. I'm, I'm curious myself, so uh, awesome. Awesome, till next time, I'm Noel T. Manning II for Meet Me in the Movies Open Dialogue, and that's a wrap. Thank you. Marco, thank you so much, good to see you. And yeah. uh, appreciate your time and look forward to talking to you down the road. Pleasure. Pleasure. It was fun. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.